We can open it up to questions or comments. Does anyone have, uh, I know this is an abstract uh, conversation, but if anyone has any observations or, or questions or comments. So for most of human history, um, hierarchy, power, wealth, wars even, were all placed around finding eternal life through religion. Uh, but today we spend 50,000 times as much on avoiding terror than we do on avoiding actual biological death in terms of there's a you know, $350 billion uh, homeland security plus war budget and, and only $9 billion spent on cancer, heart disease, and stroke, the three leading causes which dwarf everything else. Um, I happen to believe that interstellar travel is only possible through cryonics, that until we learn to freeze and using new technology, freezers plus microwaves equals cell live system freezers, then we're not going to be able to go anywhere near the energy budget of a generation. So I'm wondering, do you see uh, the, the, the desire to attain eternal life, perhaps through cryonics, as uh, resurging in terms of for people's everyday motivations and how they spend most of their budget? Yeah, sure, I'll take that. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, um, you know, I think everyone has some sort of fear of death, and I think it, it's what drives a lot of people, you know. Do you spend your time lounging on the beach, or do you spend your time trying to, like, do something to, like, make an impact on the world um, so that it's better for the, for the next people? Um, you know, there certainly are a lot of people out there working on that. I mean, there's people actively re researching cryonics. There's... Um, you know, millions of doctors trying to battle diseases. There's um, people like, uh, it's not Alex Gray, there's some other guy who's really into yeah. uh, life extension. Oh, Audrey. 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 Audrey Gray, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, so it's certainly on people's minds. I mean, it's the, the sort of thing that people have been dreaming about from the days of alchemy and even, even before. So, um, I, you know, Defeating death is kind of an impossibility. It's more about like extending life because eventually, you know, if according to science, the, the universe will yeah. die at heat death. The universe itself will die. And so, you know, uh, it's, you're just kind of putting off the inevitable, whether that's for a thousand, ten thousand, or a million years. And uh, um, certainly a lot of really interesting sci fi deals with this topic of, of death. And like the culture series does it really well. And, um, you know, it, it's a society in which, and you know, they, yeah, Ian Banks wrote uh, a lot about this where, you know, no scarcity and they have a, you know, can take a snapshot of your mind and beam you digitally from place to place or if you die a horrific death and people do it all the time because they can just make a new copy of you and you just pop into existence again, um, you know, people get a lot, take a lot more risk as well. That's kind of one of the consequences um, imagined of, you know, okay, if dying isn't such a big deal anymore, okay, let's go base jumping, but let's not bring parachutes because that's, like, not as aerodynamic. But you could do something like that if you just know you're going to walk out of the rejuvenator 5000 at the end of it. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, in my novel, uh, it, was a, it was a novel about uh, longevity, uh, the beast with 9 billion feet. It was about a group of people who had decided that they want to live forever. Uh, and uh, there was no solution as such. There was no magic answer at the end of it. But the idea was that they wanted to begin the project. Uh, and they wanted uh, to have no restrictions whatsoever uh, on their uh, abilities or their desire to tweak themselves, if necessary. And what they find is uh, that there is a trade-off, that uh, if you do extend your life to, say, 150 years or 160 years, uh, the kind of changes that you need to make to your body uh, means that you would lose language. Uh, so you would lose the ability to process language, right? So if you're willing to make that uh, trade-off, then you could live for 200 years or 250 years. But you would be reduced to the level of, a, say, an animal uh, that communicates purely through uh, ritualized behavior, right? So uh, I think dreams are not interesting uh, until there are trade-offs uh, for those dreams. Uh, so the thing with uh, immortality dreams is that people don't have a good trade-off. So you live forever and do what exactly, right? Uh, you'll play on the beach every day. Right? The idea of what you're going to do with that eternal time has not really been, uh, ever been answered. Uh, and I think there's a philosopher, Bernard Williams, 
I think, who discussed this question and came to the conclusion that it's not philosophically feasible uh, to have an immortal existence. Because uh, what would you possibly do? Uh, an infinite amount of time means you would have, be able to do infinite number of things. At the end of which, what, right? There's still infinity waiting for you. Uh, <laughs> so that particular thing of uh, living forever, I think uh, the real question is, uh, what would you be willing to give up? Is there a good thing that you are willing to give up? In that case, the question becomes interesting. So until we don't have an answer to that, uh, it is not particularly interesting. Uh, and as for as for regarding things like space travel, I think there are alternates. For example, you could have generational spaceships in which entire families live on these spaceships, and you don't go to the stars, but your great great grandchildren will go to the stars. Uh, so here, here's a question: Would you be willing to give up your body for immortality? Personally? Yeah. Yeah, any day. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is an area, again, where technology is catapulting people into some pretty deep metaphysics. You know, and I think one area that's really clear is that there's really a split that people normally are able to conceal from themselves very easily, that these kind of possibilities tear right open. And it, I think it's really clear that, for instance, your example about um, space travel, or just the simple mundane of having a population that is healthy and productive and can do all these things that people uh, do that is of social utility and all of these kind of things, uh, lead to one sort of set of conclusions uh, and, and, and thought processes about this uh, longevity question. But there are quite other ones that come when you start pushing a little bit into what some of these uh, immortality technologies really would be about. And a lot of them are actually exactly the same as the clunkiest uh, cultural image of these things, which is the, the uh, Star Trek transporter system, you know, where you're dissolved into, into atoms and reconstructed on some planet. And there's been pointed out a lot of times, often by people dealing with more up-to-date uh, questions like downloading into computers and these kind of things. Um, um, but what's not really considered with that is what if you actually, uh, you know, your spot, you're beaming down to the planet, and you decide, well, let's just copy him instead. You know, let's, well, there's no, what's the functional role of actually getting rid of spot number one in order to put spot number two on the planet? Put spot number two on the planet, keep spot number one still in the transporter bay. Um, but then, two minutes later, lead spot number one off into a side room and, and shoot him in the head because we haven't got room for him on the spaceship. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, revealing the fact that all the time, actually, there's been this issue of death going on in the transporter system that people have been able to hide for themselves. You know, <laughs> spot number two on the planet is just, hey, I'm Spock, you know, I've got all my memories of Spock, Spock's still here. But Spock number one, who actually got dissolved into atoms in the, in the transporter suit, <laughs> was actually killed, you know, but in a way that was ni nice and clean and, and, and didn't cause any uh, big uh, problems for people. Now, as I say, I think there's a whole bunch of technologies that are pushing people right into these areas, you know. Um, I, I'm sorry to take up so much time, but I'll just very quickly one more. Is I don't know whether people have uh, come across this extremely excellent um, uh, short book by a, a scientist called Hans Moravec, where he gives a, a, a model of uh, downloading into computers. And it's, uh, as, as anticipated, extremely like a transporter beam thing. He says, you've got this machine, it scans you into the computer, and as it does so, it burns out your brain. So by the time that you're actually finished with this process, the biological you can just be pushed over like a brainless zombie. And you know, you now exist as a conscious being. Well, you, sorry, I can't do the quote mark thing and speak at the same time. Just imagine some virtual quote marks are there. Um, you uh, are in the computer. But of course, we know, you know, that's question begging on an absolutely massive scale. Are you in the computer? Has something else been created that is now in the computer and the original you has been killed? Would you even be killed? How much would it freak you out, the fact that there's now two of you around? You both have your memories and both think you, then you and one of you or both of you is disposable. You know, I think that these questions are just going to become absolutely right in people's uh, faces. <laughs> okay, let's see. <laughs> I think, I think in the, when we get to the end, I'm going to have absolutely nothing to say about cryonics and interstellar travel. But I... It's rough, man. <laughs> but but I, I, I want to get... 
I channel my inner Marxist because that's what was coming out when your when, when your question began, particularly over the um, the, the the question of uh, a the, the the support for institutionalized religion being about a, being a quest for uh, for you know immortality and salvation, and b the sort of like you know current military spending as as a quest for protection because. I actually think neither of those institutions are actually about those things, right? You know, uh, that, that, that they're actually both about sort of accumulation of power and capital um, and, and, and its concentration in particular kinds of hands and that, the, and that the shibboleth of eternal salvation or the shibboleth of eternal danger from um, unknown, unseeable others uh, are simply but, you know, convenient, ways to, convenient ways to do that. What that suggests Similarly, is that we might take a different kind of view of what the notion, what notion of immortality might be here. Not a view of, in, of personal immortality, but a view of institutional immortality. And while none of us has ever managed to live for 2,000 years, the Catholic Church has been doing pretty well. Um, and while none of us has managed to live for 2,000 years, the institution of, tro of total war has similarly been doing pretty well. Um, and so it's a quite, there's a question of at what level do you want to sort of take these things? And I think it's intriguing that, and I think it is part of the sort of the science fiction story as well, that we continually sort of read these in terms of individual experience, human experience, personal experience, um, bodily experience, and sort of tend to forget about the classes, the institutions, the larger social groups in which we, to which we belong, nations, the concept of nationhood and the rest of it, and these things that do actually persist, that have a life beyond ourselves, that have a life um, outside of ourselves, that have a life that draws upon our human experience but is not captured, so, captured solely um, by it. There was something else I was going to say. I was completely what, what do you think the effect would be if humans had a longer lifetime on the lifetime of these institutions? Would countries last longer if, if their citizens were living longer as well? Well, so the first thing is that we clearly are living longer, although the ways we're living longer are not actually necessarily that we're getting older. It's that you know, we're largely eliminating very early deaths. And so, so you know, average lifespan, has, average lifespan has been rising. I, you know, I have to take that as an empirical question. As an empirical question, I don't think we have enough data. Well, yeah, we, no, have, totally we have enough data yet. Totally um, <laughs> well, I mean, what we're talking about is institutions that we haven't seen die yet. And so any kind of speculation about would they last longer becomes kind of complicated by the fact that we've never seen them go away. Mm. Um, and so, so you know, we don't yet know whether they may be you know, entirely immortal or what forms of immortality, immortality they, they exhibit. So until we see one of them go away in any kind of like serious way, and I don't mean you know, particular nations winking out of existence, which clearly has happened even as we continually create more of them, uh, but the concept of nationhood winking out of existence um, seems, uh, seems, seems distinctly less likely from where we're sitting right now. One of the themes that we seem to be exploring here to some extent is um, the question of our own usefulness in these future worlds. Um, and Zach, you imagine and are creating a scenario where quite likely humans will not take center place any longer. Could you say a little bit more about what role we will have and kind of what, um, what, what point we'll find for ourselves? <laughs> So the question is, like, what is the role of humans in some sort of world where we've been made obsolete? Well, or because there's a lot of anxiety about, you know, how useful we'll be to this, this future scenario. Um, so, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that I enjoy reading is, is and the, the tools that I end up building are, are, are they're tools, right? They're, they're machines that give you a, a force multiplier, right? So, so a hammer is good because you can, apply a lot of force to a really small area that you couldn't with your hand. Um, and a 3D printer is, allows you to build an object that you couldn't possibly build by hand. And so a computer allows you to program something and then the, the computer will carry out these calculations a billion times faster than you can and you can run it on a cloud system and theoretically one person could write 
a system that can serve millions of other people. And, and one person just physically can't serve millions of people, right? And so, you know, I, unless we unleash something that is self-modifying and takes on a life of its own, we're really only building things to serve ourselves. And so the human just, we evolve with our tools so that we work at a higher level, right? So before, um, you know, before the advent of the printing press, people would manually write out things. But then as we got the printing press, people started working at higher levels because of this. And, um, you know, I see with automation of manufacturing and um, digital fabrication, I see people moving more into design roles instead of craftsmanship roles. And, you know, there still are craftsmen. There still are people that manually de develop photos. There still are people that, um, you know, we have extremely high resolution 2D printers that do full color, but yet we still have people making watercolor paintings. So, um, you know, I think in that world, um, it's just if you want it, if you want to have your ideas and your force be able to be multiplied by many orders of magnitude, you can take advantage of that, but you know, I don't think anybody's gonna be forced into that. Is that something you'd agree with, Rick? Um, I, 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 I sort of a, do a, one of those annoying question, question things by just yeah. saying to Zach, do, do you know Samuel Butler's work? Because the extraordinary thing about that is how early it was. He was a contemporary of Darwin's, and, you know, the age of steam engines, and he was already speculating that um, what he could see around him, the extremely uh, combust and just crude sort of mechanosphere that he was seeing there, was becoming alive. And he even speculated that it would attain a superior level of consciousness to any that humans no, it was not that it would become, it would, you know, pass the Turing test and become like us. It was heading to some unimaginable, superior grade of consciousness that, that was to us unimaginable. Um, so obviously, it ties in interestingly with your your remarks. You know, um, he, he said that just like a a bee pollinates a flower, you know, humans are the pollinating insects of machines, even at that time. You know, we, we, we tell ourselves uh, that they do what we want them to, but as far as the machines are concerned, we're just these useful, useful little bugs that assist them in their reproduction cycle before it becomes uh, fully autonomous. And both of those perspectives are coherent ones, you know? I mean, if you were looking at things from the side of the machines, um, um, what do humans do? The, the, from the machine's point of view, they're not just uh, they're not just there to help us. Uh, they're there to uh, incentivize us to assist them in their reproduction evolution, which, you know, they're obviously very successful at, at uh, doing that. And I don't think you have to look at machines in order to be able to see that, right? You could also just argue that we're, we're, we're in a way that millions of bacteria have invented to like, carry themselves around in the world and get back from place to place. Um, I mean, I mean you know, there's this argument that places we, we tend to place ourselves at the center of any of our explanatory stories. And it's like, like low what we are as the products of, as the products of evolution and you know, what, what will we find to do for ourselves when we're no longer at the center? It's like, I'm not entirely clear we're at the center. <laughs> to start with. Is there anything else? So we've talked about um, the future a lot, but in, in the present, and can we consider that we've already sort of entered this post-modernist world in which, in which through the computer age and through digitalization that we've talked about, uh, knowledge has been sort of transformed into into merely information and in which communication only becomes sort of language games and 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 no more exchange of knowledge, in which case we maybe are already those machines that we in the future fear to face. In which case we're maybe already those machines that we already surpassed ourselves and and we've talked about the mortality of institutions, but what about the mortality of knowledge? <laughs> yeah, I'll say something crazy. <laughs> um, you know, in many ways, we are very different from what we were before. Um, you know, with the technology that we have now, um, 
you know, I carry around a supercomputer in my pocket that is a photo lab and can reproduce to a high amount of fidelity um, music. And so you take someone from 100, 200 years ago and, you know, would they be able to function in modern society? Would they be able to get up to speed on, on what we have? Um, you know, even the educational system and our understanding of the universe as it, as it stands is so much different. Um, you know, I mean, we used to believe people when they were sick, and now, now we don't do that anymore. So, um, not entirely <coughs> sure what the question is, but, you know, I think while we might still be able to breed with someone from, you know, two centuries ago, we're, we're very different from where we were, and so, in some sense, you know, we have exceeded ourselves, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think we've hit the singularity yet, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's what I call that. Uh, I think we do have an example of postmodern people, uh, but maybe not, not in the present, but maybe about uh, 1,500 years ago, 1,600 years ago. And uh, this came about, and I was reading a lot of uh, Indian folklore, this is collection by this writer called A.K. Ramanujan, and he collected folk tales from around India. And the astonishing thing about those stories is that uh, they read like postmodern stories, like something that Beckett would write, or uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the French modernists, the, the dependence between language and reality, for example. Stories in, there are stories, for example, there's a story in which the prince marries his left half, right? Uh, they're really peculiar, bizarre stories, and it comes from a perspective in which uh, uh, it's not our perspective at all. And they make no sense today because those people were thinking a little different, right? The way they, they thought about space, time, personhood, were all very different. Uh, so they feel alien to us to some extent. Uh, the, fact, the fact is we have had people like that before. And uh, there's no reason why the, the people in the future should not be strangers to us. Uh, but the, the second point is that uh, I think that the scenarios in which we are inevitably in conflict is not, n not necessary. We have had an example of uh, having machines who work for us for free. We just call them slaves, right? Uh, so we had, a, we, had a, we had a phase in which we had machines who were as intelligent as us, and we treated them like machines, and we tried to control them like machines. Uh, but ultimately, we had to come to a stage where we had to negotiate with them. Uh, and I think that that's, if we ever create machines who are uh, who have consciousness, who have language, who are intelligent. Uh, there might be a phase of conflict, but ultimately I think we'll have to, we'll enter into a stage of negotiation and we'll learn to live with them uh, rather than against them. Uh, that's one scenario. But yours sounds like a novel actually. <laughs> uh, I, I can see two more questions. So maybe we'll take two more questions uh, and then wrap it up. Uh, I see a lot of makers have a yeah, beautiful life. They do what do what as they want to do, and uh, it's something like uh, communalism. You know, what you mean? Communalism. Communalism. And uh, is that mean in communalism is some kind of future of make a moment? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know about the maker movement, but um, you know I feel like um, the open source movement has things in common with the ideals of communism. So open source is about sharing the knowledge with anybody. Anybody should have it. Like nobody owns the knowledge because it's owned by everybody, and so it's this community, the communism, the community is, you know, related to that, the, the root of the word. And so in, in open source, you have this very uh, egalitarian, this very equalizing idea of, hey, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, um, because we all own it, it's all shared. And um, so, you know, I think that's one area that I see a lot of parallels, a lot of, a lot of uh, common ground. Yeah. I think the future is going to be optional. Uh, we, are, we, are going, we are moving towards a world in which almost everything is optionalized, right? The reality is that what, what we can't change. 
So the opposite of reality is not virtuality or digital and so on, it's actually optionality. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we are moving towards a world in which we have optional lives, optional societies, optional worlds, right? And we'll see progress in those terms. The more control we have our options. Uh, so if, if there are maker communities that want a communist way of life, uh, that would be one option. But there could be extremely capitalistic maker societies, right? Uh, it's possible. For example, the Ayn Randian world. I can imagine the Ayn Randian world of makers. Right? She called them makers, in fact. Uh, there, there were makers, moochers, and looters, right? Uh, so she imagined a maker society that was extremely capitalistic. Uh, so it's, you know, it's an, it's an option. I thought of something else. Um, so, you know, another, another thing you can look at is, you know, one of the tenets of I think Marx, I, I don't know all the right words for this, but um, is sort of this, the sharing of capital and the access to the means of production, which is another way of saying the tools to make stuff, right? And so if you look at all these makers, and you know, I saw this directly in 3D printing with the open source machines is saying, hey, the, okay, there's these really cool technology and it's $100,000 to get a, like, a nice Stratasys machine. So how can we make this cheaper? How can we um, get this in the hands of, of more people? And here's an ironic thing, is that people call this the democratization of manufacturing. Um, but like nobody's out there voting on their freaking 3D printers. <laughs> it's more about like how do we get these expensive capital rich machines into the hands of, of normal people. Um, and so, so I, I see some parallels there. I mean, I'm not a very political person, but um, you know, I think it is a good thing to let average people have access to tools to do interesting things and you know, potentially better their lives. I mean, I know quite a few people who have built companies using 3D printers. Um, there's certainly a lot of people out there building companies making 3D printers. I mean, the Maker Faire here is a huge example of that. I mean, there's you know tons of, of people around us in hardware, like Seed Studio, DF Robot, um, making and building 3D printers. And yeah, yeah. Someone take this from me. I'm not sure. OK, we'll, we'll just take the, the last question. Hi. Um, when you were discussing uh, auto automation and the idea of like uh, devices, like the hammer being tools, being an extension, tools and technology being an extension of the human body, kind of reminded me of Wally -E and how like the fat humans are just sitting in these uh, devices that do everything for them. And so I'm wondering if you believe in the future that the gap between human physicality um, and and the reality, day to day reality and uh, is growing, if there's a gap between that, and if so, is that going to mean, is that a preservation of the human body, in that we will just be sort of preserved, preserved from the external world because we'll be able to communicate and do everything in this sort of technological knowledge environment, or is it something that makes the human body uh, inutile? I mean, I for one would totally be happy to be a brain in a tank with a, with a gigabit fiber connection if it's possible to have a equivalent or better avatar that I could control. I mean, if that would happen, yes. I, this, this is like a one step in the evolutionary process and, you know, I would be fine to leave it behind. I know that in this world there's probably a s only a small amount of us that would want to do that, but um, I, I would, I'd be willing to do that. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, just going to say, I mean, I think there's, there, there's two parts to your question that are worth sort of separating out. Um, and I mean, one is a question about virtuality and the other is a question about, about, about the body, I think. And the, 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 and the virtuality one is, is, is worth being careful about, right? Because I think we frequently talk as if we live in a world that is somehow now more virtual 
than it was before, and therefore less something else, less corporeal, less material. And I, and I fundamentally don't believe that. Right? The world is absolutely no more, more, no more virtual now than it was in the 19th century. Right? We, we've got a different kind of way of configuring things, and what we frequently call virtuality is merely displaced materiality. It's like, you know, there's still, there's still things. They're still in the world. We still fundamentally depend upon them. Um, uh, and and it's important for us to remember that they're still there, um, and that and that they still take on sort of you know physical form. That then raises this other interesting question with respect to brains in bats or brains in computer, you know, or or or, dig or digital cells, right? Which is where is the stuff? There's still stuff. Stuff breaks. Stuff has to be maintained. Stuff has, you know, and yes, okay, so then you get into your sort of singularity argument about, oh, it's okay, if stuff's going to like look after yeah, the other then, stuff. Then you have but it's like, um, here, right? and it's like, it's still, you know, we, I think it's a mistake to think about this purely as virtuality. Those things are every bit still as material. It might just be that there's a slightly different kind of configuration that we decided um, is, is, is optimal for our immediate needs. Any last words? Any last comments? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>